and you look at the whole Bible, the first two chapters are paradise, and the last two chapters are paradise. And what's in the middle? Life as it really is. Life with suffering. And when we think about that, our response to it, and part of what's prompting me right now is what I read this morning in my devotionals, and it was talking about life on earth, and one of the devotionals talked about if life is just too good, what will we do? Probably won't be here this morning. Because life that is full of roses for people, even for a season, and it never will be forever, they don't need God. They're fine. They're happy. You know, it's, it's like the guy that's drowning. The guy that's drowning, you throw a life preserver to him, he's going to grab it and hold on with all his life. But if he's just out for a swim or out waiting and you throw a life preserver to him, he's going to look at you and scoff at you. And there's a passage I was thinking of in regards to this life that I think is really helpful for us to look at. And it's found in Proverbs chapter 30, and it's from Augur. And this is what he says. Oh God, I beg two favors from you. Let me have them before I die. So he's asking two things of the Lord. This is in verse 7. Verse 8, he says, First, help me never to lie. Hmm, that's a good one. We all need that one. And here's the second one. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. And here is the reasoning why. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. You know, I think when we look at life and we look at the world and we get a glimpse of the world and we live out our world, it is full of pain and suffering. I look around this room and I know you guys. And I know what you go through, and I know the pain that you suffer and the things that you deal with. And rather than just do like the Buddhist or the other, some religions say, oh, just think it away, it's really not there. Or try to mask it with some addiction or something in this life to try to please us and keep us from thinking about our suffering, which we do. By the way, you know what an amusement park is? You know what it is to muse? Muse means to think. You know what amuse means to do? Don't think. And we tend to try to amuse ourselves in this life and think that everything is okay, and it's not. We just try to kid ourselves. But we need to look seriously at it And we need to contemplate it, and we need to learn how to live in suffering because it is a part of life. And as I mentioned, I love that one song where it gives us that, and I think our scripture does that for us as well. And I want to review a little bit from chapter 50 that we looked at, which was the third servant song. And in two weeks, we're going to deal with the fourth servant song, which is the pinnacle of Isaiah. And we're going to look at that on uh, Palm Sunday, moving up to Holy Week and the death of Christ. But I want to review a little bit because Jesus gives us a glimpse. He is talking here. And he gives us a glimpse of what is in store. He said, I offered my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. And again, Jesus is beginning to reveal here in this servant psalm the suffering that he will go through. He would be despised and rejected by men. He'd be ridiculed, tortured, and beaten. It doesn't say here he will be crucified. That'll come later. But he begins to give us a glimpse of 
what he will endure when he comes to the earth. And it gives us a little bit of a glimpse, yet we don't have the full truth of why, but it helps us to know a couple things. First of all, when we think about suffering, God chose to suffer to bring help to us. God doesn't just stand aloof with us wallowing in our sin. And again, we mentioned last week, a lot of our suffering we are we self-cause. We do self-destruction. I know I do. And, you know, I went out to start my burn pile yesterday and, and I poured gasoline on it and I wanted to make sure and I was way off and I struck it. Boy, I burned my eyebrows off and singed my face and, and it was like stupid you know you ought to know better and you know thankfully I didn't hurt myself really but it's like that's what I do and some of mine is self-inflicted because I'm an idiot and that's just the reality we live in but see God doesn't leave us in our suffering he could but he doesn't he became the recipient of evil and suffering. And again, he doesn't yet in this chapter, in this third servant song, explain why he does it, but he understands, and this is very important for us to understand, he understands our suffering, and we can trust him to help us in our need. You see, God may not choose to remove the evil and suffering in our lives, and most of the time he doesn't, does he? But we can be sure that there is no suffering we will endure that Christ does not understand and he will bring comfort and help in our suffering if we look out to him and we reach out to him. And that was the last part of chapter 50 that we looked at last week is the two responses to suffering that we have. One of them is to turn to the Lord, and that's verse 10. He says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys His servant? If you're walking in darkness without a ray of light, trust in the Lord and rely on your God. And so what he is saying here is he's given the characteristics of those who will be saved, God's people. And there are four things in this verse he says. God's people fear Him. And again, we talked about last week, it's a healthy fear. But it is understanding that we are under God's wrath and we come to Him begging for forgiveness. We obey Him, we trust Him, and we rely on Him. And the last two really go hand in hand. If you don't trust somebody, you're not going to rely on them, are you? You've got to trust the Lord and rely on Him, and He will help you. But the other path which ended the servant psalm in chapter 50, we looked at last week, He said, But watch out, you who live in your own light, and warm yourselves by your own fires. And again, what's that, what's that referring to? The self-sufficient person who doesn't need help, that's going to do it on their own. They're going to warm themselves on their own fire. And you are going to look for your own light. And how many people do that? We live in a world that's full of that. It's the self-sufficiency. I don't need God. I don't need anyone. I can do this on my own. And he says, this is your reward you will receive from me. You will fall down in great torment. And the thing is, there are two aspects of that. Eventually, they will fall in this world whether it's at their deathbed or sometime before, that they will come to a place where despair will take them over. And it refers to eternity as well, where they will suffer in great torment. Now we look at chapter 51, where the Lord turns back to Israel. And again, we talked about this with each servant psalm. After we see Jesus describing his ministry and things. Then it always goes back to Israel and what God promises to Israel and what he will do for them. Now, in each one of those, we see it expand out to the world, and we will in this passage. But he speaks, to start with, to Israel 
but I would expand that out to all of God's people. I mean, let's look at verses 1 and 2. And as he challenges them to trust him in that suffering. Listen to me, all you hope for deliverance, all who seek the Lord. Who's he speaking to? God's people. Consider the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were mined. Yes, think about Abraham, your ancestor, and Sarah who gave birth to your nation. And Abraham was only one man when I called him. But when I blessed him, he became a great nation. And so what we see here is him addressing God's people and he's calling them to remembrance. Remember your past, where you came from. Now specifically he is speaking to Israel and the father of their nation, Abraham. But he's also speaking to us because what Paul says, the true sons of Abraham, the true children of Abraham are who? Those who believe. So we need to expand this out, not just talking about Israel, but to us as well. And and I want to refer to what Hebrews says about Abraham. Look at what Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, says about Abraham. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God, obeyed when God called him to leave his home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. Hold on before you turn. I want us to think about this. Part of faith is stepping out into the unknown. We've got several young people graduating from high school this year in our church. And it's stepping out into the unknown. Everything is, you know, you've been under your parents' roof, which you probably are going, I want to get away from there, I want to get away from there. You know, but you had security and safety, and things all lined up for you. But then when you graduate from high school, you step out into the unknown. And that is at different stages in our lives we do that. You know, sometimes somebody will stay in the job that they're in because it's secure. It's the only reason they're there. They're making a good paycheck. They're making what the money they're getting by. And they may hate it. And I know, man, I had a, a friend of mine that graduated from high school. And the day before he graduated, he went to work to build a nuclear power plant 25 miles from where we lived. And I think he has retired from there. He spent his whole career right there. Never had another job. And part of it was, I don't know that he necessarily liked it. He might have. But a part of it, I think, was the fact that he was making good money and he wasn't willing to step out to make a change. See, Abraham had life comfortable when God called him. He had a home that he went home to every night, four walls, you know, nice comfortable bed. But he left all that and he never had that again. He lived in tents his whole life from there on. By the way, he wasn't a young pup when he left Haran, did he? He was 75 years old. But look what it says in the next passage about him. Abraham confidently looked forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith. So again, what he was looking for to finish that thought was something beyond this world that was permanent. That's why he was willing to leave everything and follow the Lord. But here's the other part. It was by faith that Sarah was able to have a child even though she was barren and too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore, there was no way to count them. Again, God promised Abraham at 75 that he would give him a descendant that would become a great nation. It was 25 years later 
that Isaac was born. And it was miraculous that he was born. And the idea that we see here of Abraham, and I think what Isaiah is telling us, there are two points. Look at the rock that you were hewn from. He calls Abraham a rock. And there are two aspects of that. You exist miraculously. You're here because I chose to birth a nation from a man and a woman that were too old to have kids. Remember that. But also, and I think this is as significant and maybe more significant, is look at him as a pattern you're to live your life by. A pattern of faith. Even in difficulties, and Abraham had a lot of difficulties. Look to that and pattern your life out of that. On another note, and I thought it's interesting as I read through the commentaries this week, there was another person who was named a rock. Remember who he was? Peter. Jesus said, you are no longer to be called Peter or uh, Simon, but Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Now again, we went through this when we looked at Matthew. I believe what he was saying there, he was speaking not just to Peter, but to the apostles and their message of following Christ and their example that they would follow, which would be what? Suffering. Death. I mean, if you study the apostles in their lives, ten of them were martyred. And if you want to add Paul to that, eleven. The other one, John, died isolated on an island imprisoned. Not the future that you're looking forward to, high school graduates, is it? But it's the life of following God regardless of what's going to happen. And they are our examples for that. And so here's the thing, and this is a principle I think we can draw from these first two verses. Our salvation in Christ should encourage us when we're facing suffering. And we're going to look at a little more of this as we go today. But when I am crying out to God, where are you? Do you really care? Do you see me in my mess? Our immediate response to answer that is, yes, you do. Because you died for me, and I'm trusting you. And I think that is an overall principle that we are to live with and understand that in this life you will have trouble and suffering. It is a part of life. We talk about it a lot here. But when we're going through it and we're questioning whether God is there and He really cares about us, yes, He does, and He's proven it by dying on the cross for us. Isaiah goes on to give assurance and hope for those that are in exile in Israel. Look at verse 3. The Lord will comfort Israel again and have pity on her ruins. Her desert will bloom like Eden, her barren wilderness like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found there. Songs of thankfulness, thanksgiving will fill the air. See, when we define hope, and I think that's what he is giving to them, comfort comes from hope. And what is hope? It is being able to look to a future. That is good. Now what is that future that Isaiah is giving to Israel? Is it them being led out of captivity from Babylon? Is that the Garden of Eden? No. Again, study Ezra and Nehemiah when they got to Jerusalem. They were threatened all around by the, the bands and everything else. He is speaking of the last two chapters of the Bible. Where there will be a return to the first two chapters of the Bible. Eden. And that is our hope. See that God someday 
will take care of all this. And I think that's important for us to understand. And when that happens, and it should be happening now, joy and gladness will be found there. Songs of thanksgiving will fill the air. We will be glorifying and praising God for eternity. He goes on and says this in verse 4 and 5. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, Israel, for my law will be proclaimed and my justice will become light to the nations. And I mentioned this a while ago. He's speaking to Israel, but who else is he speaking to? Everyone. My mercy and justice are coming soon. My salvation is on the way. My strong arm will bring justice to the nations. All the distant lands will look to me and wait in hope for my powerful arm. Now he is looking at possibly two events here, I think. One is, when does he bring justice to the earth? When will God bring justice to the earth? Good Friday. Justice was served. We sing about it all the time, don't we? It was when Christ paid the punishment for all the sins of all the world. And then he is also looking at that time when judgment will come on the earth as well. But this is the promise of restoration and deliverance that we see in this. And I want to look at verse 6 where he challenges God's people to observe the world they live in. He said, look up in the skies above and gaze down on the earth below. For the skies will disappear like smoke and the earth will wear out like a piece of clothing. The people of the earth will die like flies. I want you to just contemplate what he's saying here. What is he saying? Everything you see with your eyes is temporary. The skies will be gone someday. Now, I don't know how long the stars have been up there. Long time. The earth that we see, the mountains we see, you know, there's a debate of how old everything is, but it's been there a long time. But the day and the time will come when they're gone. And every person will die. Like flies. I don't know about you. I've already got flies dead on my floor in the house. I'm having to pick up flies already. Springtime is here. But we're all going to die. And I think about all the loved ones that I've already lost. That's one of the things that happens when you get old. But I buried so many of the people of this church. You know, my mother is not in good health, and I don't know how many more days or weeks she's got left, or months. She may live longer than me, but I don't think so. That time's coming. Death is there. It's inevitable. And we need to keep that perspective on this life. But what lasts forever? My salvation lasts forever. My righteous rule will never end. You see, in these three verses, the word my is used nine times. My, 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 my. God is saying, I am personally involved in all that's going on. So when we think that God is not here or not available or not involved in the world he is saying I am here every moment of every day and I am here to help you and this should impact the way we should live our lives when we look at the temporary world we're living in it should cause us to change our priorities we should live our lives in light of eternity next slide we should live our lives in light of eternity what does that mean for the things that will last forever. Not just the temporary world that soon disappears. It's all going to be burned up. It's all going to be gone. 
We live in this world, but it should not be our priority. Eternity should be. The Lord tells us how to do this in the next verses. Look at verse 7 and 8. Listen to me, you who know right from wrong, you who cherish my law in your hearts. Again, who's he speaking to? God's people. Do not be afraid of people's scorn or fear their insults, for the moth will devour them as it devours the clothing. The worm will eat at them as it eats wool, but my righteousness will last forever. My salvation will continue from generation to generation. So what's the principle he's challenging us with here? First of all, we need to understand there will always be those who will scorn and insult us. There will be those that want to destroy God's people. He's speaking specifically again to Israel, who as soon as they get through with one group, there's always another group. You know, I, somebody made a, asked me, what do you think about what's going on in Israel? This was back in October. I said, it's been going on for 35 years, and it'll be that way till the Lord returns. There are always those out to destroy God's people Israel. I just That's their curse. We saw it in the Holocaust with Hitler. We've seen it in multiple times throughout history. But it's also the story of the church, isn't it? Jesus said, if they persecute and kill me, they'll persecute and kill you. We live in a country where we see very little persecution. We may get a few insults and a little bit of scorn, but we're not oppressed. And if you think you're oppressed, you need to go somewhere where it really happens. Because it's not. But there will always be those that do that, and we do not need to fear them. And we need to stay strong <coughs> with where we are. And I think that the challenge is that we look at life the way Paul did. And this is not related to just insults and, and scorning, but life in general, the suffering that we see. Paul said this in Romans 8, What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory you will reveal to us later. See, it's a very temporary thing. Paul talks about it in other places. See, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. And what's the prize? Eternity in heaven where all the suffering, all the pain, all the sin, all that's gone. Because when we've been there, as the song sang, 10,000 years, our mere Decades that we live here will just fade away in the glory of God. So the Lord tells us not to fear people, to endure scorning, insults, and suffering faithfully because we have a wonderful eternity in heaven. Now it's interesting, we see a little switch here in the next three verses. But before we go there, I want to challenge us. Have you ever been in the midst of your suffering? And you cry out in a prayer, God, are you asleep? You see what I'm going through down here? Where are you? That's our next Three verses, or two verses, look at it. This is God's people. Wake up! Wake up, O Lord! Clothe yourself with strength. Flex your mighty right arm. Rouse yourself in the day, as in the days of old when you slew Egypt, the dragon of the Nile. Are you not the same today, the one who dried up the sea, making a path of escape through the depths? So that your people could cross over? Now again, I don't think those that are 
praying this prayer, whether it's Isaiah or the God's people, really think God's asleep. But it's metaphorical. And what they are crying out, God, do what you did in the past. You delivered us. And we know that you can do it again. It's not questioning whether God can. Do you notice that? It's saying, I know you can. Won't you do this? Please? And here's the thing. God never despises those prayers. He never despises them when His children cry out for help. He responds to our pleas. But that doesn't mean He acts immediately or in the way we want Him to. And that's what we see next in verse 11 and 12. Where the Lord speaks back to His people. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear and they will be filled with joy and gladness. Yes, I, I will comfort you. Now again, is he, is he speaking of when Ezra and the people walked back into Jerusalem? No, they were weeping when they got home. The whole city was in ruins and torn down. And they were afraid because there were all those people around them that wanted to hurt them and they had no protection. That's not referring to this. It's not referring to the return from Babylon. It's referring again to Revelation 21, 22. And I think it's important to see that. That God will someday victoriously restore Jerusalem with Christ as the king and the Jews will be returned to their homeland. But it's when Christ returns. And here's the important thing. Were any of the people who were praying 9 and 10, did they get to see that? Not yet. They died with the hope of that time. See, I think it's important to realize that. But see, it's that hope that brings us comfort. Have you ever heard the saying, you can do anything as long as you know there's a limit to how much it is? By the way, that's the problem with hell. There is no hope of it ending. But as God's people, we have hope. We have hope knowing that whatever's going on in my life isn't going to be there forever. It may last the rest of my life, but it won't be there forever. And God's challenging His people who are in despair to look to Him. He will answer. But again, not necessarily the way we think He will. He may not cure our cancer. He may not restore the relationship that's broken. He may not give us what we cry out for and help, but He will give us comfort both now and hope for a better future, even if it's not in this life. And with this hope, God's people do not have to fear. Look at the next verse. We bring up that word again. So why are you afraid of mere humans what, who wither like the grass and disappear? Why are you afraid? But see, fear can paralyze us. And it's rooted, all fear is rooted in this. It's a failure to trust God with the future. Fear is the result of not trusting God with our future. Isaiah goes on and says this. Yet you've forgotten the Lord your Creator, the one who stretched out the skies like a canopy and laid the foundations of the earth. Will you remain in constant dread of human oppressors? 
Will you continue to fear the anger of your enemies? Where is their fury and anger now? It is gone. Soon all your captives will be released. Imprisonment, starvation, and death will not be your fate. I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea and causes its waves to roar. My name is the Lord of heaven's armies. And I have put my words in your mouth and hidden you safely in my hand. I stretched out the sky like a canopy and laid the foundations of the earth. I am the one who says to Israel, you are my people. You have forgotten the Lord, that's why you fear. But remember, you are my people. And I will take care of you. See, it may seem, and this is, and we need to have this perspective. It may seem that either God cannot help, He's not all powerful, or that He no longer loves us and cares for us. It may seem that way. And by the way, that's one of the main premises of the study we're doing on Sunday night with God and evil. Because the premise is, if God is all-powerful and all-loving, why is all this stuff happening? And that is a perspective that we can have, but it's not true. And that's what Isaiah is challenging them with. And those who are faithful will proclaim God's promises even during a time of suffering. By the way, this is one of the theories of sufferings that we looked at last week. It's the megaphone theory. Is when suffering is taking place, we have an opportunity to declare the goodness of God. That's what this is saying. I put my words in your mouth and hidden you safely in my hand. He's put his words in whose mouth? In his people's mouth that when they're going through the difficulties they still stand firm and proclaim God. It's a person who's dying in the hospital. It's a person who has lost his job. It's a person who has lost everything in life like Job did, yet stands firm in his declaration of God. And that's what he's saying here. But it is because they have overcome fear. And how did they do it? First John tells us how. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. This is a process. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. We can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Now we'll stop there for just a second. Two things. We are not afraid of the day of judgment. Does anybody in here ever have a fear of death? Do you fear death? Because see, death is the time of judgment. And if you fear death, it means your faith has not matured. Now, I don't have a death wish. I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying that we don't have to fear the greatest enemy out there, which is death. Because God's already taken care of that for us. And as we grow in our faith, we don't fear death. And I can tell you, working at the hospital and watching people die and being around people that are dying, those who have a strong faith in Christ die in peace. And they're very quick to say, do not intubate me. Don't be doing CPR on me. Just let me go. I'm going to a better place. That's my mother. She has no fear of death. But that is mature faith. And he goes on and says, and this shows we have not fully experienced his perfect love if we fear. He goes on and says this, and the the rest of it. Oh, that is the rest of it. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows we have not fully experienced His perfect love. See, when our love in Christ matures, fear is gone. 
We don't fear man. We don't fear the future. We don't fear the unknown. Because there's a confidence knowing that God is in control. He loves us. And He will fulfill every promise He's made for us. Again, Christ did this when He went to the cross. And God's faithful followers will stand firm in the face of every difficulty. And we end this passage with Isaiah reminding Israel of this. Look at the last section here. Verse 17 and 20, he is reminding them of the judgment that has taken place on Jerusalem. Look what he says. Wake up. Wake up, O Jerusalem. By the way, you remember when Jerusalem questions God? Did the personification a few weeks ago? The Lord's saying, wake up. You have drunk the cup of the Lord's fury. You were destroyed. You've drunk the cup of terror, tipping it out to its last drop. By the way, that's an important term. The last drop was poured out. Not one of your children is left alive to take your hand and guide you. These two calamities have fallen on you, desolation and destruction, famine and war. And who is left to sympathize with you? Who is left to comfort you? For your children have fainted and lie in the streets, helpless as antelopes caught in a net. The Lord has poured out His fury. God has rebuked them. Now again, we've talked about this, and I'll just mention again. God allowed the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem and Judah. That was God's punishment on their rebellion and wickedness and failure to follow Him. But he's saying in the next verses, that time is over. Look at the last three verses here. But now listen to this. You afflicted ones who sit in a drunken stupor, though not from drinking wine. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in such despair? It's like, you know, if you haven't been drunk, don't go get drunk. But it's like you just can't function. You're in so much depression and despair, you just can't function. This is what the Sovereign Lord, and I want you to see His definition of Himself. Your God and Defender says, See, I've taken the terrible cup from your hands. You will drink no more of my fury. Instead, I will hand that cup to your tormentors, those who said, We will trample you into the dust and walk on your backs. We've already mentioned this, that the Jews suffered at the hands of lots of tormentors. And Christians have suffered at the hands of lots of tormentors. And if, even if we don't, there is a lot of suffering. But here is the hope. And again, I want us to have that hope. When we come to Christ, how much punishment will we receive from God. How much? None. Our punishment is over. And that even means for the past sins of this life. Then there will still be human consequences to it and physical consequences to it. But God is not punishing us. And that's his message to Israel. My punishment is over. I love you. You're my children. Come. Let me be your God and defender. I will protect you. I will bring you safely home. Now again, we don't know how that God will do that yet. We're going to get to that in a couple of weeks. But we're on this side of the cross, and we do know how God did that. And we see it in Romans chapter eight, uh, chapter 5. Look what he says. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. What is condemnation? Punishment. Because of Christ. And now he goes on and says this, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son, while we were still His enemies, by the way, he says it twice in this passage, Christ didn't die for the righteous. He didn't die when we got it all straightened out. He died while we were sinners. We will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus has made us friends of God. And I want to close with that. I mentioned at the very beginning of the sermon that there needs to be a healthy fear of God. But that healthy fear will diminish as we mature in our faith and we see God as our friend. And He is our friend. Jesus <coughs> told His disciples, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And there's an intimacy there that we are privileged to have. And we're privileged to have it while we suffer in this life. That God is there. He is a close friend, like Proverbs says, that's there in our time of need. And He will never leave us and forsake us. And that is the hope that Isaiah is trying to communicate to the nation of Israel. In whatever affliction you're in, and again, they went from one to the next. Have for the last, you know, 2,700 years since Isaiah wrote this. They go from affliction to affliction to affliction to affliction. But those who turn to him, by the way, most of the Jewish people haven't. And so Christ isn't their friend. He isn't there helping them. They're in their despair. But those that turn to him, and all of us who turn to Him as believers, He is there as a constant help for us. And so we do not have to be in fear or despair. We have hope. And our hope is in the cross, in the resurrection. And so as we come to communion at this point, by the way, Parents, if you want to go get your children, you can at this time so they can take communion with us. But as we come to communion, are you feeling heavy with the burden of your sin? Do you feel like God is far away because of your suffering or what you're going through or unanswered prayer or whatever's going on? Do you have that sure confidence and you're facing life without fear because you know that God has it? See, that's where we need to become. That's where we need to stand because when we are not walking in fear, we're not paralyzed and we're able to move forward by faith in what God has in store for us. And that's the challenge that the Lord places before us this morning. Am I trusting in what Christ did for me and I'm fully trusting that and nothing else? And therefore I have hope and whatever comes, I'm going to be okay. Spend a moment in prayer and then as you complete that, come forward and get communion and we'll take it together as we close in my message about the, sing, the songs we sing. And sometimes it's easy just to sing the songs and not fully grasp the meaning.
And I want us to just look at the lyrics. I'm not going to sing this to you. I want you to finish communion with me. But I want us just to look at these lyrics. And as he stands in victory, who is standing in victory? Christ. Sin's cursed has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. That's powerful. And remember when I was looking at one of the passages where he says, I put my words in your mouth. See, when we proclaim this in our darkest moments, when we proclaim this in our deepest despair, that gives us a megaphone to the world of saying, whatever I go through, whatever I suffer, I will praise my God and my hope is in Him. And it's because of the cross, because of what Jesus did for us. He suffered, but He victoriously rose from the, from the dead. That's our hope. And so when we eat the bread, we are proclaiming Christ's death saves us from our sin and the curse is broken. And when we drink the cup, we proclaim, as it says in Romans 5, that we are now friends with God. Let's drink. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It is such a comfort. And it is a comfort because we have hope. We don't live in a fairyland world where everything is fine and nothing bad ever happens. That's not reality. We live in a broken world that you chose to enter. And you chose to redeem through your blood. And our hope is not in what this world can bring to us, but what we will have in eternity. And keep our eyes on that prize. And help us to live our lives in such a way, Lord, that we will proclaim you with our every breath. Help us to live as those who are redeemed. And we pray, proclaim this in Christ's holy name, amen. Stand with me and let's close with our benediction. It was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. God bless you. Have a great week. A uh, lot of things going on that you can get involved in in the church this week. Encourage you to do it.